Hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And today, my guest is a slight departure from what we've done in previous episodes, but I'm happy, thrilled, in fact, to have Sally Vance Trimbath, a theologian, on the podcast today. Sally, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm so happy to be here, Robert. Thank you for having me. Now, I didn't warn you, but I always have guests introduce themselves. So um, if you don't mind, imagine you've arrived someplace, you don't know anyone there, and you have 30 or 45 seconds to give the brief on who you are. Go. Hi, I'm Sally Vance Trimbath. I teach at Santa Clara University. I came here um, from Notre Dame, um, but before I was at Notre Dame, I grew up in Iowa, and that gives you a pretty good picture of who I am. Okay. So... I asked you on because about two years ago, we had a conversation talking about the many overlapping aspects of Christian belief and climatism. I'm going to use that term, climatism, climate uh, apocalyptic okay. environmentalism. Okay. And so given your background in theology, those are the things I wanted to explore. And before we go on, you, you're a theologian uh, and you study the relationships between the Catholic Church, academia and, and wider society. Is that that's what you're. That's about. correct. I'm really I'm very interested in the Catholic Church as an institution and how that institution intersects with other institutions. So there are some connections here because of the Vatican Forest and how the Vatican City, they will get to that in a minute about carbon credits and so on. But. Um, but you've also written two books, I think, John Paul II's Ut Unum Sint and the Conversation with Women in 1999, and then Theologies and Dialogue, The Place of Religion in 21st Century University. So I wanted to, given that title, I wanted to ask you about that, about this idea of environmentalism as the new secular religion. Okay. In your own students, do you see that? That they're oh. less, less church going and more environmentalist? Is that a fair way to, how do you see that? Yeah, 100%. And by the way, you're very kind. Those aren't books. Those are journal articles. You're very kind to give me credit for books, but they're, they're that. thank you for that. But yes, I do see that. Um, and I see that. And again, I teach at a Catholic university, a, you know, a Jesuit university in Silicon Valley. And um, a lot of my students have, you know, are raised Catholic and the number of those of my students who are going to environmental studies, which is a new degree at Santa Clara, fairly new degree at Santa Clara, uh, it, it's just exploded. And also I have, and the other side of that, that I think that at least in answer to your question, lots of students going into public health, but with an environmental concern. Now, so back in the day, you'd have students who were going to, I'm going to go to medical school. Now the language is public health and how we, you know, intersect with disease and the environment, you know, the, the asthma in polluted areas. So, yes. Um, and and just to, just to be clear, Santa Clara's mission is very, you know, public service oriented. It, it always has been. Um, so it's not, it, it's not surprising that a lot of my students would want to do public service, but um, uh, not nearly as many of them, many of them are directly going to serve the church, the institutional church. They're coming in the door of um, many of them through environmentalism. Well, and, and that public service idea, that's part of the Jesuit ethos has for a long yes, time. Yes, right? 100%. It's, it's, you know, do a little good. That San Ignatius is saying, go somewhere and do a little good. And full disclosure, I, I had one un, very undistinguished year at Santa Clara University way back <laughs> in the day um, and then went on to do other things. But uh, I remember it well. So you, what you're saying is that, that the secular, it, it, well, is environmentalism secular religion? Well, I think it is if what you say, I mean, there's so many different layers to this, but so at the, at the first pass, yes, in that if, what if religion is that which binds you, you know, what, what that, that people say that to themselves, I'm, I, I'm, I have a connection to this that goes to my own identity. 100%. It, it is a, a um, religion. Then when you move to the next level of a church, so a church is a community of believers, right? It's a, it's a community that is somehow institutionalized. So I think it's helpful to make 
um, distinctions there because that's a lot of what what my students will say is, well, they'll say I'm not religious. And one of the first things I have to say to them is, yes, you are. There's no such thing as a human who's not bound to something. So if you're an atheist, that's your religion, right? So you're, you know, unless you just don't care. So, and that's what I say to them. So are you saying to me that you don't care? And then they, you know, that opens up a conversation. So that, that's a really a trope for, for students these days. And one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm so, not so religious. If, so if I can interrupt, you're saying everyone yeah. is a believer. Uh, well, I think to be human is to be a believer because, right. Because the way that we enter, we're the, we're the creatures who are present to our own experience. And then boom, the next thing we do after we're present is we have some thought about that. And that thought, you know, distills into belief, but, you know, so you have, you know, you, you have intense different layers of belief, but yeah, I don't think that I, in my judgment, and certainly in Catholic theology judgment, there's no such thing as a human who isn't committed to some kind of belief system. If they're not, if they're Hannibal Lecter, then they, you know, somehow they've ceased to be human, right? They, you know, they've, they've, um, they've stripped themselves of their humanity, but that's a whole nother conversation, but th there's no such thing as a human who isn't present to his or her experience. And the way that our mind works is the minute we're present to it, we say to ourselves, well, what does that mean to me? You know, I'm enjoying being out here on this hike on Mount Tamalpais. I mean, your, your, our minds automatically go to the next question. Oh, gee, do I want to come here again? <laughs> Why do I feel this? How come I feel better here than I feel in the crowded bus on the way over here? So uh, there, uh, this idea about environmentalism as the, and, and, and Michael Schellenberger writes about this in his book, uh, Apocalypse Never. There are a lot of other people have made the same, same observation, but that environmentalism as, as Schellenberger says, the dominant secular religion of the up educated upper middle class elite in most developed and many developing nations. So why do you think that's true? Why is this n worship of Mother Earth or nature then supplanted traditional religions and, and in particular in, in Catholicism? Is that due to the, the Catholic Church's myriad issues and foibles, including the sex scandals? I mean, how much of that is contributes to this and how much of this is just... Uh, uh, well, let me ask you, so why is this? Why has this become such a, a popular belief system? Um, well, I think a couple of things. First of all, to, to kind of move into Michael's space, you've got a, a, um, that vector is a suspicion in the institutionalized religion. So people have started to distrust them. And yes, the Catholic Church is in the, let's be just really clear about this. The Catholic institutional church is in the worst crisis since the Reformation. And that means decades, maybe a couple of centuries to survive this. So this is no joke. This is not going to go away in, you know, 10 years. And, and it's just amazing to me that we're not really well, that's a whole other conversation. But so Michael's thing is, you know, people, um, when it comes to beliefs, the next thing we do when we believe something, oh, I love being on the top of Mount Tamalpais, because we're social creatures, we're going to look to an institution that helps us. Oh, gee, maybe I'll join the Sierra Club, or maybe I'll go on a hike once a week. So we institutionalize that. But we're in a time just globally as human persons, and this is real, you've done such good work on this, Robert. I mean, um, and again, full disclosure, I mean, I use Robert's work in my class. I mean, that, you know, do we trust the institutions that run the power grid, right? So we're, we're suspicious of institutions for all kinds of reasons. And one of the most ancient institutions is organized religion. And um, what, okay, so that's the first thing to say. Then the second thing to say, when it comes to religion as an institution, one of the ideas about religion is that religion interprets all reality, right? <laughs> it isn't just about the power grid or about whether or not Mount Tamalpais should be preserved, but when people are talking about institutional religion, they see that as the way that they understand the universe, they understand their own existence, they understand the power of love, the power of hate, right? So um, religion has these long-term cosmic um, ideas about it. And sadly, one of those ideas is what happens at the end? How does the world end? What is what, you know, that the meaning of our existence is the way that it ends. Now, that's not the only 
um, uh, belief, important belief of religion, but it's an enduring one. So apocalypticism crosses all religion, all religious traditions, because it's it, it's one of the ways to answer the question: What's the relationship between me and Mount Tam? I'm just going to stay with Mount Tam Pius here for a second, right? You know, because it, 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 once you start exploring that, um, why you are nourished by the environment, that's going to lead you to where did this come from? What's my relationship between me and Mount Tamalpais? That's going to lead to the question of what's my status in creation? Am I more important than this land mass? Because, you know, we certainly, most institutions would say that we are, right? Our jurisprudence system says that Mount Tamalpais doesn't have any rights, but I have rights. I mean, so you, you start to ask all those ultimate questions and there's where you get the apocalypticism. But, uh, but Christianity and the great religions, they have a lot more to say about apocalypticism. And then the last thing I say, so that I, I don't kind of run amok here, but apocalypticism or, you know, concentrating on the beginning and the end of the world, that's a narrow slice of institutional religion. Right. It, 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 it's just in the nature of the case, it's a, na- it's a narrow slice. If I'm trying to figure out my relationship with Mount Tamil Pius, the most important question for me is not when is Mount Tamil Pius going to explode and the end of the world come? That's that's an appropriate question, but it's by no means the center, the central question. I have many other questions that I want to deal with, and that's what most of religion deals with. So when I when I hear you give that, and that's a really nice way you put it, is that religion gives us context and it gives us this meaning for what we're right. doing, why we're here, what you know, and what's next, right? And and but I want to follow up on that uh, apocalyptic idea that uh, the one thing that to me it jumped out in and in our discussion now two years ago. In fact, it was at the Breakthrough Dialogue, and your son, by the way, Alex Trimbath, is a uh, 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 co-director at, at uh, uh, Breakthrough Institute now, uh, right? And has done great work on a lot of different issues. But this, I, the overlap, it seems to me, when you talk about uh, apocalypticism, is that in both cases with Christianity and with this, uh, the climatism, there's this overlap between this idea that we we've sinned and now yes. we have to repent yes. and we have right. to get right with God. And right. in the the Christian tradition, that getting right with God is something we have to do on a personal basis with the climatism the, right. that there, we have to get right with the earth and we have to go right. back. And and this is one of the things I really want to get back to is this idea of going back to the garden. Am, am I on course here? Well, how do you see that, that overlap, which seems to me in that apocalyptic idea about the future that somehow there's a sin idea right. here really at work, particularly when it comes to the use of hydrocarbons. Yeah. That, that and it, it, it uh, thank you for that. Yes. I mean, there, that's, um, if you, if we're looking for a center of gravity, a, a helpful place to start is with that, the creation story or what the people of Israel called it, the story of the beginnings. And if I could do one thing as a teacher, it would get, it would be to get people to take an appropriate look again at that story, because most apocalypticism makes use of that story, right? Says, here's what God intended. Everything was groovy, right? You know, the, we had this great relationship with the animals, everything was fine. And then we screwed it up, right? That's the primary um, interpretation of that story. Okay, that is incorrect. <laughs> um, and it, it's incorrect on many levels, but at least two levels. One, um, uh, th- that both deal with, with Michael's point, um, which is that we need to have a lot more respect for the people who wrote that story. And the people who wrote that story, right, were the people that we now call the Hebrews or the Jewish community, right? But they weren't, you know, they were still in their sort of um, uh, working on their own identity when they write that story down. But um, and, you, and here you're talking about Genesis and the Garden, yes, of, right. the Garden it, it, of Eden and, and where, where we humans were sinless and, we, and then we fell from grace. Is that right? The, the yeah, original yeah. sin. We get kicked out of the garden because God created this, this, this place that didn't have nuclear weapons and didn't have pollution and didn't have clear cut, right? None of those things were going to happen. And then we, out of selfishness and human greed, we destroyed that. Okay. 
That's that's the interpretation of Genesis. Okay, there's many things wrong with that, but there's at least two things wrong. The first thing that's wrong is if that's the case, then if that's the case, if we as these creatures can wreck creation, then our the way that we think about God is really faulty. Because if right, um, if 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 the the source of all reality, whom the Hebrew, the people of Israel, they were geniuses about this. And I mean that very clearly. I believe that that's the truth about reality. But even if it's not true, it's still a genius idea. The idea that the source of all reality is the living God, the God that's on the side of life, not all these other screwy pagan gods that are killing people all the time and then it, that demands sacrifice, right? So the, first of all, the notion of God, that the living God can have this plan for creation and that, that one of the creatures can destroy creation. So it makes God into an incompetent. That's, I mean, that I means just on the face of it, don't turn your God into somebody who we can screw up. Yeah, that's the first thing to say. But then the second thing to say, and I think this is more important because you have to do this, this work first. Christians didn't write that story. That story pre-existed Christians and Christians took that story and they used that description of who is the living God and what is the human relationship with what the living God has done, right? So the living God has given life, right? Has, is the source of all flourishing. And, and in that story, human persons are at the top of the pyramid of that flourishing, right? We're, right? We, God loves the giraffes and thinks the giraffes are cool. But God says humans are cooler than giraffes, right? Are, are more important than giraffes, right? Sure. Giraffes are good. Humans are very good. Okay, so we're this valued creature, right? So the question for the people of Israel is to try to figure out, okay, the living God gave us this gift. What's our status before this gift? Because we have tools and you, this is what you think about, write about, talk about so brilliantly, we have tools that the giraffe doesn't have. We can protect the giraffe, our own environment. The giraffe can't, not to the degree that we can, right? So there, the people of Israel, to come, I'm coming for landing on this. The question for the people of Israel was, what's our status in creation? How do we, where, where do we fit? And it's the Christians who take the story of Jesus suffering, right? Jesus, the image of the crucifixion, you know, the torture and the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection. And Christians say, oh, that, that the meaning of that story, the story of Jesus suffering is grounded in Genesis. Well, what, <laughs> how does that work? So, but that's what we, that's what we did because we wanted to have a relationship with the living because we because Christians said, "Whoa, Jesus makes the claim that his daddy is the same person and the category is person, right? Jesus' daddy is the same person who created everything, right? And then he finds himself executed and tortured by the most powerful institution on earth, right?" So Christians, right? So people who were following him who said, whoa, we, he's the next development of Israel, right? He's the next deepening of our understanding of our status in creation, right? He, because he, he believes in the living God, right? He, he has that view of the living God. But, uh, okay, but sorry. I, but stop. I hear you going is that, that, that there's that connection. You're saying that 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 Christianity then ties back with the Genesis and that somehow that there's the, that, that there's sin there, right? That, right. that, that we weren't the caretakers, right? And that's the part where I see the climatism and, and, and Christianity overlap, which is a little right. bit different in talking to uh, my friend, Jared, Meredith Angwin, who's Jewish. She's written a great book called shorting the grid. I've had her on the podcast a couple of times. She said, well, the Jewish faith doesn't really see that fall from grace, that it's right. a, different, a different idea about, no, that, that, that God is our rede redeemer. And in fact, I talked to her this morning. She said there, there isn't as much focus on this idea of original sin, but the, but the, 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 the bridge that I see or the connection, the overlap that I see between the climatism 
and the and religion is this idea that well we've sinned against the earth right with the climate change is evidence that we haven't taken care of the garden and our way to redemption is to go back to the garden so and right. nuclear energy being the ultimate in the the true the the apple of knowledge and that we've gone too far right and, right and, and does this rhyme with you does that make sense absolutely and i and i completely agree with your your, your the jewish scholar that we uh, so to kind of come back to this so i'm not kind of running amok um uh that uh the 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 strain in christianity that took that story which is about the origin of grace right so grace is how is our relationship with 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 livingness with goodness that's what grace is it's the gift right and one of the gifts that we have that the giraffe doesn't have is we have the human intellect Right. We have the search for greater knowledge. And and in that and, story and the, ability, and the ability to create, which is God likeness. Right. That right. that is what connects us. Right. And that that is where we seek that communion with God. Is that is right. exactly. on the right track here? And that origin of sin that that um, one of the great myths is to kind of back up one step. We need to be much more respectful when we read that story and say, OK, what were they after? And they were after articulating how we're going to navigate the origin of sin, right? Not the original sin. It's not like a virus that was passed on, which is how a lot of Christians see it, right? That, you know, because, because the um, Adam and Eve were disobedient, which is another completely wrong category. I mean, the way that I, um, I, I, I think of it or, and, then, and I'm not the only one. And, and now we have to overcome that, right? We have right. to atone for that original fall from grace, our original discontinuation right. with God, and that we have yeah. to atone. But that's the same, isn't it? In in the same in in, in climatism, right? That we have this. Oh well, we've we've lived too well. We we're, we're using too much. We have to use less. We have to go back. I mean, you've even seen this in you know in the yes. writings of Bill McKibben and some of these other you know. Oh no, no hydrocarbons, no nuclear. I mean, this is the dogma of the Sierra Club. I just saw it yesterday right. on their website. Yeah no hydrocarbons, no nuclear, all renewables, which smacks of this, oh, we're going to go back to the garden, that that state right. of right. innocence where we won't transgress. And, and, right. And, 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 that, that is a growth. I'm with you. And that is a, it, that we need to deconstruct that story because that is that, that notion of atonement, which is another thing we stole from the, that's, that's too strong, that we, we appropriated from the people of Israel, which means at one minute, which means to have that relationship stronger. It, and of course, sometimes atoning is for how you failed, but most of our relationships where we, you know, get stronger, we don't, you don't have your kids over for your anniversary and say, let's talk about all the ways I, we, you we failed as parents to you. Right. Right. Instead, the you kids want will, a, the kids will tell you that, you know, uh, sure. Ask. <laughs> but, but what you really want when you gather, you want to be able to laugh about the few failures. Right. But what real atonement, it's coming together for strengthening. But there's where I, I like to call attention to, you know, the, the, the gruesome death of Jesus, because that was a challenging image for Christianity that they said, we need to figure out the meaning of this story you know, the destruction of Jesus by human selfishness. And we need to put it in line with all the other ways that we failed. So what one strain of Christianity did, and Augustine is the famous one, but he's not the only one, is they said, oh, well, we can explain how we, how it is that we came to kill Jesus by what Adam and Eve did back in the day. So that the connecting, orig- connecting the death of Christ with the with the fall from grace in the garden. Right. So, Sally, I wanted to touch back on one of the points that you made earlier about this idea of credibility and the supplanting of traditional religion and church going with this secular uh, secular belief, the apocalyptic environmentalism. You mentioned the many failures of the church, and you said you you talked about the the fact that the Catholic Church is in the greatest crisis since the Reformation. What are the other parts of this, though? Is that is this just a natural evolution in our society, like in the, in Holland, where there are very few believers, very few churchgoers anymore, mm-hmm. right? That that is this a natural progression, or is there something that environmentalism offers a better set of 
belief systems or doesn't require as much um, uh, sacrifice or doesn't require to be there at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. What, yeah, what yeah. are the other reasons for this? I mean, you've seen this in your own students. Yeah, yeah. I think there's two. One is we've done, and now I'm doing Catholic inside baseball. As a Catholic church, we've done a poor job of teaching, right? Because one of the things that the institution is there for is to help you. The institution has wisdom about your relationship with Mount Tamil Pius, right? So I fall in love with Mount Tamil Pius. So I want to find the community that lives in Marin that knows about Mount Tamil Pius, right? So, uh, so that institu- that's one of the things that institutions do is they guard and protect and they pass on wisdom. I don't care if it's, you know, the City Hall of San Francisco or it's the Knitting Club, right? You, 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 wisdom, I mean, institutions need to, to do teaching. That's why the church is the, the magisterium, means teacher, right? We've done a poor, poor job of teaching. And why is that? Because we've concentrated on the easy slogans and slogans are good, right? We, we, all teaching is going to involve good slogans, but the best teaching takes the slogan and deepens it and helps you understand it. So we've done a poor job of teaching. And then another thing that we've, that I think we've, re- we've tremendously failed at is liturgy is the other thing that it, that it, that it, that a religion does for you, that an institution does is it allows you to express those ideas, right? The more affective emotion or liturgy, the public work of the people that we're ritual, the the ritual, the ritual part of that process being, being key part of it. But but environmentalism doesn't really have that ritual, does it? I mean, the the kind of coming together and the, you know, the singing from the same songbook, right? I mean, this is one thing that a a lot of different religions come together. They have sing from the same hymnal, right? That's become this, you know, it's a, a catchphrase that we have, but where is that? let me put it a different way or or put that question a little bit differently. Is environmentalism a strong enough faith to sustain people's souls? No, not without you. Any, well, I think answer your question again. No, because we, those deep, deep questions for most of us, every once in a while, you know, uh, it, some of us are meant to be monks and go pray by ourselves and we don't need those institutional forms, right? So there are people like that. But most of us need those um, community gatherings, those community spaces. The and ritual, it, the rituals and the, and the songs right, and the singing right. together, that, that community that gives you a sense of belonging. But if you think about this, Robert, so yes, you know, singing from the same, the same hymn book. But now a lot of our hymn books are songs that have no meaning for our children or they, too, have terrible theology. Right. Because the, the, there's a the relationship, you know, so the, the way we believe is expressed in how we worship. Right. So that's one of the great principles of, of Catholic Christianity is what we think is expressed in what we do. So the Eucharist, the, the great prayer of Thanksgiving that expresses who we are, who God is, who the community is, right? So there's, there's an intense relationship. And we have not done a good job of making sure that our rituals continue to do that for people. So what nourishes the, um, a, a young person's uh, belief that, that, God, that the source of all creation is good, right? So one of the things you experience on Mount Tamil Pius is you say, oh, well, maybe I don't need to be in despair <laughs> about the, 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 the space of the climate. Maybe what I need to do is I say, oh, what's my role here? So that's a different saving, stance than saving Mother Earth. Right. right. And, that, that, well, and that the Earth becomes the supplants God, uh, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, all the whole cast of characters because we can see this here and touch it now. And that or is- as I'm sure your your Jewish friend would say, or it's just continuing the work that Christians and Jews and other religious organizations have always done, which is that the appropriate way, one of the pieces of wisdom from religion is that we do have a relationship with the earth. The relationship isn't that we sinned against it, isn't that we're the enemy of it. That's apocalypticism. That's not what the book of Genesis says. The the book of Genesis does not say dominate the creation. It says tend it. 
shepherd it, guard it, protect it. You do, Adam and Eve, you do have a different status with regard to it. It needs you. In the, and not in the sense that um, what needs it. Yeah, 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 yeah. takes that a couple steps further, right? Too, that, but takes it too far. And that the atonement is recycling or driving a Prius or, you know, whatever it is that this is your way of getting right with, with nature slash God, right? Where, and it doesn't require you to be, to go to church, right? It doesn't right. Require, well, <laughs> and, and let me bark up. You. Go ahead. Well, bark up your alley a little bit, because you know what else that apocalypticism is? It's unscientific. How so? Follow the, here, well, here. that in what other area of human ingenuity, whether it's electricity or the coronavirus or, you know, what new materials we're going to use to build bridges, right? What other area of human ingenuity do we make the claim we know the end of this scientific discovery? We don't do that with anything else except nuclear power. I mean, you, you know more about them than we do. So, so what we, I hear, but what I hear you saying is that, you, that you, well, I'm paraphrasing here, or you're leaping ahead. Maybe you're saying that w- this absolute belief that we really have messed up the climate and we're doomed, that that idea of that the apocalypse is, 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 is upon us is wrong. It's well, I, I don't know if it's wrong. I mean, I, I, well, I think it's wrong, but it's unscientific. It goes against the way we do everything else. How do we do everything else? And you, you did this so well, right? That we look at, okay, what's the actual situation on the ground? What's the problem we're trying to solve? What, how do we apply our search for greater knowledge to that? We don't look at that and say, oh, we've already solved that problem, or we have, there's only one interpretation of that problem. In the history of human knowing, every time we do that, we end up, right? Somebody comes along and says, you were so wrong about that, right? So we, we think we know, you know, how old the world is. And lots of people come along and say, what are you going to do with fossils? And for, right, for a long time, people say, well, fossils are, you know, we have to put them in, we have to force them into this previous idea that we came up with. That's what I mean by it's unscientific. It's, it's, um, well, it goes against, and huh? What's, and what's popping into my head is Galileo, right? Who Exactly. You know, his, his, right. his famous feud with the church and, and nevertheless it moves, right? What was his line, right? Yeah. So if you take it back to Adam and Eve. Adam and the the description of Adam and Eve eating the apple, right? Which we see as, oh no, you know, they disobeyed. No, that is a description of Adam and Eve saying, oh, we, we're supposed to eat of that tree. That's the, tr- the, the tree of the, the, of the knowledge of good and evil, right? That's a descriptive story. It's not a, oh, you know, don't touch the hot stove story. It is, it, it's the, the way that the people of Israel said, this is who you are. So it's not God say tempting um, Adam and Eve. It's Adam and Eve coming to self-consciousness. And becoming, and, and becoming fully human in the garden. Right. And, what, and how do they do that? This is what I mean by unscientific. What's the primary locus of, of, of that story? It's the knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge human knowing, the human capacity to interpret, explain, greater, have greater understanding of their reality. And so, if you will, science. And have, so that's and what have, I mean. And have, and have personal agency in on you, the planet. Exactly. So let me, so if, so if I could, I'm just going to reintroduce you. So my guest is Sally Vance Trimbath. She doesn't have a book out. She's not, uh, there's no uh, a call to action here. She is a theologian and a, and a longtime friend of mine. Uh, she teaches at Santa Clara University for how many years now, Sally? Uh, since 2006. So 15, right? No, 16. But you've been teaching theology for how? Oh, yeah. I, I Yeah, I've been teaching for a long time. I, 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 I Pardon me. I mean, I moved to San Francisco in 2001 is when I actually began my first, you know, uh, university teaching job. Gotcha. But um, you've been teaching theology and looking at Christian theology in particular now for, for decades. For decades, right. And so let me go back to this one other idea here that I think is interesting and and and, and applies to this overlap between climatism and uh, Christianity, Judeo Christianity, in 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 many different aspects, but I I've, I've thought of them as as uh, messianic climatism, 
right. that there are the few messiahs that are have been sent here and you and you know i'll name them michael mann uh mark jacobson from stanford near you michael mann from penn state uh bill mckibben uh naomi klein th- these people are warning us they've been sent to warn us that climate right. change is, is the apocalypse is coming the apocalypse is here we have to change we have to remake ourselves the human species has done wrong to the earth and we have to repent we have to atone and there's something about the you know i think of jeremiah or the other prophets already saying oh you've done wrong and you're going to get punished and even the overlap of and you're going to burn in hell right right and right the other the other part of the the warming climate that this is well you're going to you're going to suffer because it's not going to rain and there's going to be drought and you're going to it's going to be incredibly hot and everyone's you know th- that is the apocalypticism that that you mentioned before but it seems these messengers these messianic uh climatists or um yeah. they're the messengers right We're here to right. warn us but it's right. is there seems a very much a religious aspect to that and and it particularly in in persecuting any apostate who would dare right. question their orthodoxy of how they see the coming apocalypse. Am, am, right. Does that make sense to you? Am I on it the makes, right track? It absolutely makes total sense to me. And, and, and this is, if, if I have a mission in life is to try to help students um, uh, see this, that, well, that first of all, I meant what I said, it's unscientific. I'm not a scientist, but it seems to me it's self-referentially inconsistent. The you know, people who are so the apocalypticism you're talking yes, about now. That's, right. So you said it's self self-referential. I'm sorry, say it again. In self-referentially inconsistent that you say to yourself, oh, I'm the person, I have this knowledge about carbon. I, so, right. I have this knowledge about carbon and I know it fully and I'm going to apply it. Well, that's inconsistent because you're 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 making the claim that you you know the truth about reality based upon scientific knowledge. But scientific knowledge does not stop and say, okay, there's one interpretation that will never be adjusted and changed. That's not how science works. I mean, you QED, Dr. Fauci's emails of the last few weeks, right? At the beginning of the virus, we didn't think that masks would help. We wanted, right? Um, So science doesn't work that way. Science knows. Science says as scientific method that the minute we come to see, understand this notion of the virus, we're on the hunt for the next way it's going to develop, or what other things can we learn? That that's what I mean by it's self-referentially inconsistent. You can't call yourself a scientist and then become an apocalypticist. It, it seems to me because that's not how you became a scientist. Because they're trying to freeze the knowledge. That's better said than I. They freeze the knowledge, and what is that? Um, Robert, that's ideology. That's where understanding human thinking, right? Which is a good thing. Climatism right? as climatism as ideology rather yeah. than as science. Right. Because yeah. what it is because we as human beings apocalyptic climatism. Right. We want to understand, right? So you fall in love with Mount Tamalpais and you want to understand what that means. You want to develop concepts. And again, we, we've all been around people like this. I, I live near Mount Davidson in the city. And, you know, one of my favorite people that I would run into, he knows everything about Mount Davidson. He would say, oh, come out here some night at midnight and I'll show you about owls on Mount Davidson. Well, I'm not going to Mount Davidson at midnight, you know, without a flashlight, right? But he's so, Francisco, right? Yeah. yeah. But also he's he's still developing knowledge. He's not an ID. He's not an ideologue. Right. He's still on the hunt and he doesn't say I'm the only one who knows Mount Davidson. So his continued knowledge doesn't become an ideology because Mount Davidson is a living thing. It's a living thing. And he's like, you're welcome. I invite you to come with me. And I once said to him, Tom, has anybody ever joined you? Well, once in a while. Right. But he's not an ideologue. He's happy to see you. And and if you want to if, if you want him to tell you the wisdom of his understanding, he'll share it with you, right? That so my my point is here, that's how human knowledge works. But we also have a tendency, we as humans, and this is what the story of the garden you know, kind of gets at too. We do have a tendency, use that is so I'm gonna use this forever in my classroom. We have a tendency to freeze it, and then it becomes an idea, the idea, the only idea, and we use that to bludgeon or to explain everything there is about Mount Davidson. Well, that's wrong. That, that, that is not how human beings work. 
we d- we don't that, that that belief or that understanding has to continually evolve evolve and and, and that's yeah. one of the things that i think is really troubling to me about I, uh, one of the guests i've had on the on, on the power hungry podcast is uh, stephen coonan who has a new book out called unsettled looking at climate science and he's been pilloried. In fact, there was an article in the uh, Scientific American. Michael Mann was one of the authors. Naomi Oreskes from uh, Harvard uh, essentially saying, oh, how dare him? You know, oh, he's just trying to sell books. You know, don't pay any attention to him. He doesn't, uh, Gernot Wagner. I mean, these are some of the leading academics, leading institutions in America saying, oh, don't listen to him. We're not going to debate this. Uh, again, my guest is, is Sally Trimbath. She's a theologian at Santa Clara University. So, Sally, we've talked a lot about climatism and the overlap with Christianity. Um, how does the repentance in Christianity, how is it similar to with the repentance we see in secular environmentalism? Well, here's where I would say as a, in a conversation with those scientists, I would say, okay, you have your discipline. I have mine. Okay. So one of the things that if you're going to bring religion into this, you need to pay attention to religion's method, right? You have, you have to be respectful of that. And as a theologian, a lot of people aren't. They think, you know, religion is just some private thing that you figure out. No. So let's come back to just like in any other discipline, like in math, you're going to have to use learn the quadratic equation, right? So in, you know, it, to, to deal with repentance, you have to understand one of the most important ideas from Judaism and Christianity. I'm not going to speak for the other traditions because that's not my area. But for Judaism and Christianity, repentance goes back to how, what is our relationship with the living God, right? And what does the living God want from us? Does the living God want obedience like Ishtar and, you know, Zeus, you know, who want obedience? Or does the living God want faithfulness? The living God wants a faithful relationship where we are the true people that we are, right? Just like any other relationship, or like a marital relationship. All right. So Judaism and Christianity are, are genius religions because they say about religion, religion is not about obedience. Now, the minute I say that my students go wild and a lot of us go wild, but anybody who's raised a child knows the difference between faithfulness and obedience, right? You use obedience at the most basic lower developmental level so that children will be faithful. You don't, our children uh, tell the truth, not because they're obeying their mom and dad eventually, right? They tell the truth because they have come to be faithful in a relationship with the truth. So obedience is, is the wrong category. And that's the G that's the genius of Judaism and Christianity. And so, and, and where does that come in then in that idea of, 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 of repentance in, in climatism or environmentalism? How does that, we're, then they're trying to get right with the earth? How does that? Yes. Does so it, it, it's just, which is easier to teach somebody to be obedient or to be faithful? It's much easier to teach a person to be obedient. And so if you're a Messiah figure and you want to get a lot of teaching and you want, you know, specific action right now right? You're going to go to the simplest, the easiest thing to do. You're going to scare the heck out of people because, right? So, it, so obedience relies upon a lack of deep understanding. It, I mean, it does. It's the lowest common denominator. Yes. When you're, when you're raising a child, there is a period of time where they tell the truth so they won't have to stand in the corner. But if that's all you want from your child, they're not going to come have dinner with you when they're 35, right? Obedience is the, again, we, we, we make use of obedience whenever we're forming an institution. So if I go to the lady, the, the, the the group that's protecting Mount Tamalpais and I say, I want to join, they say, okay, then you better show up every Saturday to help us pull out ice plant, right? That's the most basic level. So obedience, it, 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 to, to have obedience is a human activity, but it's low, it's low on the chain of development. What we're really after is that obedience builds toward higher level thinking and towards a deepening of relationship 
where you pull out the ice plant because you love Mount Tamalpais, where you go to bed on Friday night and say, I can't wait to pull out some more ice plant because it's, it's meaningful to me, right? I have a relationship. It's not tedious, but and, just and, like- And so that redemption then in climatism, environmentalism comes through doing through recycling or through pulling yeah. weeds or something else that the good deeds are for the planet, yeah. not for other people. Yeah. So faithfulness, and this is this is one of the things that is so profoundly upsetting about it is that um, the, the idea that faithfulness involves pain, that faithfulness is miserable, that faithfulness is hard and tedious. No, that's not the heart of faithfulness. <laughs> because we're humans, will it involve that sometimes? You know, so being a good spouse, being a good mother, sometimes it, you know it does involve sacrifice. going to the grocery store when you don't want to, but that is such a narrow slice. And that's where your Messiah your Messiah figures are. That is a narrow, narrow slice of, of, of any kind of faithfulness. Sometimes you need, right? Sometimes that, you know, the, the parent needs to say, okay, I told you, we're not going to go to Disneyland. If you keep, you know, keep making your room a mess and, but you don't want it to have to be that way. Right. So, so, so the messianic climatists, the ones, the, the leaders of this movement, they're saying, oh, you just have to obey. There's no, right. there's not going to be any debate. We won't debate you because we know everything is perfect. And we, we, we have absolute knowledge. The knowledge right. on this is frozen. We're not going to debate it. That's it. Go pick up your room because I said so. Because I said so. Whereas what you want is you look forward to the day when they pick up their room because they've discovered, first of all, the joy of helping you because it's your house right? So they're respectful. They do it because they care for you, but they also do it because of the joy of having a clean room, and being, right? So and the, being self-responsible. Right. And so you, as a parent, you've passed on that faithful relationship with the, really with the world. That's what you're trying to do. And, but sometimes you have to be, you have to take one narrow concept and say, okay, what your clean room means this week is there will be no Lego pieces on the floor. <laughs> Something as simple as that. Right. Or the bed will be made. And those are very important building blocks. And that's that's to me what climate these apocalypticists get wrong. They take a tiny little building block, respect for the earth. You know, uh, should I litter? Of course we should not litter. But does that get translated into every bag of paper that human beings have ever created is an evil thing that that's the that's the that's the that's the the prophet or the the the, the yeah that, that's the prophet or the messiah but but a thing to note when do we need prophets and messiahs in times of catastrophe and and yet and more people are living longer healthy exactly we are not than it, any other time in, in right. human history and that's the part that seems to me to be the the big disconnect is this right. uh the demonization of yes. anything having to do with hydrocarbons or any who anyone who would say anything positive about hydrocarbons no right. they've only resulted in destruction well wait a minute the the woman who's working at the job and has to commute from Lockhart, Texas right. into Austin. Well, that hydrocarbons and her gasoline allows her to raise her, feed her kids. That's a good right. thing, I think. Right. And yet right. there's only one, the, the view is only, oh, that because you're creating CO2, that's bad. And there's a an absolutism here that is really, I, I think, dangerous. It is dangerous. And, and also, it, it, as a theologian, it's also inhumane in that that's not how that's not how human beings move through reality, right? So you, that's another thing. So, so then what part of it is inhumane? I, that, 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 that by we're, but we as humans, because we're using energy, we're becoming more of what we're supposed to be, right? We're becoming, right, right. we're evolving, we're becoming our best selves, right? Uh, right. I'm sure there's a whole lot of self-help books that have been, but it, it's through using energy that we evolve and become closer to it have that ability to develop our talents, right? That if, if we don't have that energy, we won't. So that, that seems to me to be almost sinful. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And what is sin? Sin is, you know, damage to relationships. That's what sin is. Sin is not disobedience to some idea. It's damage to relationships. 
and and of course when you explore that you have to say what is the right relationship so that's a, that's you know it would take us you know hours to talk about that but that's what sin is sin is not disobedience and that's the genius of what the creation story was trying to say god does not the god the true god the living god wants you to flourish and be what you were created to be just like the giraffe but the giraffe doesn't need help to be a giraffe you and i we have we have to take a hold of our identity and develop it right and that and that's where the and the sin yeah. it seems to me in the climatism is that the sin is oh well you've you've used hydrocarbons and even worse there are companies that sell these hydrocarbons and they're even terrible for even giving us that ability to to go to work or to you know right. f- fly to see our kids get married or you know whatever right right that, that there's somehow sinfulness in that using and the sinfulness is even in the i mean if we come down to it even in the evolving right 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 and those i think you you do this very well it's it um are the answer to trying to figure out the best relationship with the climate i'm not saying there's no problem there's no there's no agenda because we do have to have a right relationship with the climate but we don't get there by stopping with an ideology we get there by searching for greater knowledge which is what we're designed to do so if people if if the the messianic climate people want to convert young people they better get away from this this messiah complex because that will not change will not bring people into right relationship if you want to get people to eat less beef you are not going to get them to eat less beef by saying you know, you're sinning when you eat beef. No, you're going to figure out how do I develop their knowledge about their relate, right? I mean, it's all about moving forward in the relationship in the, I, with I like the that. human mind at work. Right. I, I like that because I think that that's critical in terms of if we're going to re- have any hope of reducing CO2 emissions, this idea that we're going to freeze knowledge, particularly when it comes to nuclear energy, which I yeah. I'm, fully convinced this is the acme of technology and this is what we're going to need if we're going to be serious, but yet the climatistas are adamantly opposed, right? Natural Resources Defense Council, you know, I've talked about this, the closure of Indian Point in in, in New York and and the near criminal act that was done by the Natural Resources Defense Council and yet Gina McCarthy is the right-hand advisor to the Biden administration. But anyway, I've, I've, I've hammered on that point many times. No, but, but yeah, sorry. Let's, let's talk about indulgences because, um, and maybe you could just briefly give us a quick uh, uh, history of, of this was one of the objections that Martin Luther had when he posted his, uh, his uh, many objections on the the door right. of uh, in Wittenberg, wasn't it? I'm yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But there's a there's a lot of overlap between carbon credits and indulgences, Absolutely. isn't there? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, indulgences was a fundraising project, right? That was a fundraising project. To you know, the cathedral. Yes, yeah. So and but but now it, you're right. It's got a, a lovely parallel. So if you are a human person and you're dealing with things like plagues and you know disease, I mean all the things. You know, human life used to be a lot more challenging than it is, right? You know, you, you're you, all of our children, blessedly, you know, didn't die of measles or didn't die of whooping cough. So just the death, uh, just death as a part of life. It was a was a it has been a big deal in human society and Christianity, you know, the death of Jesus supposedly gave people the tools to deal with death. Right. So the focus was on death and you get some corrupt bureaucrats because that's basically I mean, it's over, overstatement. get corrupt bureaucrats that say, hey, we, we can we can monetize that to use a Silicon Valley word. We can monetize people's fear of are they going to be with their the children that they've lost or their dead spouse or whatever and so you 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 take an idea right that is that, that god is somehow involved in your death right that there is life after death that's a major truth claim of christianity and you monetize that and luther and lots of other people came along and said that is not the purpose of you're preying upon a deep relationship to solve this very narrow um, problem. And it's and in that case, it's tremendously corrupt. So yes, I mean, and, and or another way to say that is anytime an institution takes the deepest question that you have, which is what is my relation, 
do I have an afterlife, right? Is love everlasting? You know, when I, when I fall in love with my children and I have that, you know, that experience for the first time, and it happens in lots of areas, but certainly with the, with the birth of a child, you, you do, it seems to me, you look at that child and say, I cannot bear that this child would ever not exist, right? It's not that I don't want them to die tomorrow. I can't bear the thought <laughs> that a person I love would ever just disappear. That's that's at least one human response. Well, Christianity says you don't have to worry about that. They're right there, right? Love is because, everlasting. Because there's a heaven and you're right, right. Up. Well, but, so so to bring it back to the indulgences, this was a way that the Catholic Church in, in medieval times, up until the time of the Reformation, was raising money from the faithful in order to to build its right. rules and so on. That yeah. this was a this was a get out of hell free card, right? Exactly. So and it was a way to use human fear. And and so the carbon credits, it seems to me that rhymes it a lot, right? Oh, you yes. can fly to Bali or you can right. fly to, you know, no. to Rome and you can have a great vacation. You go on the yacht and I mean, you see it on airline websites. Do you want to offset your carbon ba- right. with this right. thing? Right. When those carbon credit things, these they're all scams. I mean, there've been right. numerous academic studies that say, no, they're not effective. This is just right. a, it's just a guilt. It's a way to, to uh, uh, assuage your guilt of, of emitting CO2, which again, seems that, of all of the things we've discussed, the one that is the most obvious in terms of the climatism and the history of Christianity, where it just seems like there's this overlapping idea of sin and and absolution, right? Right, And it's not going to be that hard because you just need a few bucks and you can be resolved. And guilt. There's where that's another important category is guilt. So so you absolve yourself, you absolve yourself of the guilt and you somehow erase the sin and the carbon at the same time. Right, right. And that's a misunderstanding of guilt. So there's a lot. So guilt is a signal, right? You feel guilt. You do something wrong. You eat the last piece of cake or whatever it is. And you, 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 you okay, it's a signal. It was never in, in terms of human development, in terms of who we are. It was never intended to be a state. What does guilt do? It says, okay, solve this problem, right? Act upon the guilt. Whereas right. so many religious people, they want you to be in a constant state of guilt and they'll provide you with the ideas that will make use of your guilt for their purposes. So that they're so that your guilt, the purpose of nobody should ever be as people say, I feel guilty. Stop it. Either fix it or stop it. It's a signal. Same thing. And that's what the Garden of Eden story says. God is not saying, you know, you did this thing. But what what Adam and Eve do when they eat the apple and now they're now they're now they recognize each other. Now they're not just two giraffes hanging out in the garden. Right. They're self-conscious and they and that's the whole notion of nakedness. Right. What does nakedness mean? It's not some evil sexual thing. That's Christians do that to it. What what does it mean? It means we uh, two mountain lions don't see each other as naked, but humans do because that's the most private. Right. We are self-aware and our relationship with our own body and with other people's bodies, that's, we have control over that. And that's a part of what we do with that is how we define our identity. So it's a positive thing. thing. So when Adam and Eve say we're hiding over here because we're naked, that's, God isn't saying, oh, you know, I'm going to come and get you. God says, oh, who told you you were naked? Yeah. It's just like, again think about that in terms of little children but the guilt i I think that that idea about guilt too about the guilt of 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 absolving yourself of the guilt by just saying oh yeah i'm going to plant trees in you know no somewhere that 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 takes care of my guilt because i've done something good and further that you know i'm not really sinning i'm not really impacting the climate because i've gotten this uh you know this this carbon credit this indulgence which uh I think Martin Luther would have a, would had a field day. Right. Right. And it's a, yeah. And just to to, to come in for a landing on it, it's a misunderstanding of guilt. Guilt says you have to figure out what you're going to do with this feeling, which is an appropriate feeling. And you do something with it. Don't just turn it over without even thinking it through. You wouldn't do that with any other area of, of, of life. Because there's no discerning there. There's no, right. so you, you're not doing your homework on your carbon credits to see whether they're really worth a darn or not. Right. And so there you can just say, oh, well, I've taken care of that. Right. 
Well, so just a brief side note, I, I, I looked this up again because we talked about it you now two years ago um, you know, at the Breakthrough Dialogue that the, it was in 2010, in fact, I, no, 2007, and Wired Magazine wrote about it that the Vatican is teaming up with a Hungarian carbon offset company to plant the Vatican climate forest. Well, the whole thing was just a grift. I mean, the whole thing was a scam and the Vatican city officials, the bureaucrats said, oh yeah, we'll we'll offset all our carbon. There was never a tree planted. Nothing happened. So the the Vatican itself, the church itself was seeking indulgences for its own carbon emissions and they they got grifted as well, which seems to me just a little bit too delicious. Yeah. And as opposed to doing what somebody like Santa Clara did under the former president, Father Ng, when he came in, um, he said, okay, my... The whole agenda as president is going to be about climate change. And he didn't say, okay, every student sign up and buy carbon offsets. He said to all the centers, figure out what we can do. What can we do? How can we not waste water? How can we, how can we contribute to science in ways that build a relation, a, a right relationship with our environment? He didn't say, do this my way. He said, use in the past the jesuit schools we we educated the cops the firefighters the nurses and the teachers right and we're still doing that but now we said our next wave of applying jesuit education is we have another problem that that needs right relationship and i want you to use the tools of the human mind at work right that's that's ignatius in a nutshell That's what the right relationship with God is, is that, you know, put your mind and imagination to work for the sake of, you know, the whole community and the the earth is a part of that community. And by the way, with regard to this Messiah stuff, you know what Jesus said every time people asked him if he was a Messiah? Stop asking me that question. Huh? That's not I'm not. He would say, no, I'm not. And, and, And what was his answer? He would say, you know, you just turn around and say. Don't ask me that question. Ask how you can do a better job of loving your neighbor. Huh. So it's about right relationship, whether it's with the living God or the planet or with each other. And that that's what you're after. You're not after some kind of obedience that somebody else tells you what to do. So the better thing for the Vatican to do would be to say, which is what Pope Francis has tried to do, is to say, OK, here are our values and how are we going to right? How are we going to call upon the various institutions to do things that establish right relationship? So go, you you perish in the middle of Illinois, you take a look at how you're spending your money and, you know, take a look at your furnace. Is it, seriously, is it an efficient furnace? Right. And do your best. Yeah. Well, so we've been talking for, for nearly an hour and my guest is Sally Vance Trimbass. She's a theologian at Santa Clara University in California. And we've been talking about the many overlaps between climate issues or climatism and, uh, and environmentalism and Christianity. Um, just a couple of last things, uh, that I I ask a lot of guests or most of my guests, Sally. So what are you reading these days? What, uh, what's on your bookshelf? Oh, I'm reading that fabulous over the overstory by Richard, Richard Powers. Um, the, um, Pulitzer prize winning novel. It's, it's, it's fabulous. And the other thing that I've been doing during the pandemic, I'm reading everything I can about Hamlet. Oh, really? Hamlet? Yeah. Why, why, what, what, what captivates you there? Uh, well, part of it was just I couldn't, I, I was becoming obsessed with the news and it was killing me. So it was, you know, making a decision about, you know, don't do that. And then I've always, uh, uh, my, uh, I've always loved Shakespeare. I was an English, English major in undergraduate school. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to, here's a play that I've always been drawn to, but now I'm going to read the people who actually know things about it. And um, so those are the two things that I'm reading, but that over the overstory is, it is just a fabulous um, novel, but it's um, I'm, I'm not all the way through it, but if I could say what it is, uh, uh, it takes a look at trees as the center of gravity for all of life. Huh. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Well, I'll have to look that up. You know, I, I, I know I had one more question for you, but I'm going to interject one other thing because you're from Iowa and I'm yes. very closely, you know, we've talked about renewables and this idea that renewables are the way to get back with nature, right? We're going to get back in communion with nature because that's natural energy. Right. And we're, and it represents this kind of back to the garden idea. Right. right? 
Um, but in Iowa, it's almost impossible now to cite wind turbines. And in fact, in Madison County, famous for the bridges of Madison County, have passed an ordinance of, of banning wind turbines. So there seems a, a conflict, and this is just a quick observation, that this idea of going back to nature, well, it, it requires this carpeting of nature with massive amounts of industrial right. infrastructure in order to achieve this right. lunatic idea that somehow it's better energy, which to me is a perversion of this idea of return to nature. I mean, it's absolutely the wrong way to go because it requires this massive energy sprawl, massive mining, et cetera, to make that even remotely, even come, even attempting it would require this massive waste of resource. But I don't know if you had any thoughts on that yourself. I have two thoughts on that. First is, you know, to go back to nature is to, is to create the world as a zoo, right? This Adam and Eve didn't get kicked out of the garden of Eden. It's a description right? They had to leave the garden, the garden, right? They, we are not animals, not only animals. We're more than animals. We have to tend to that garden. Okay. So that's a, the first thing. It's a misunderstanding. So the idea of going back, that's wrong. And then in terms of Iowa, it's just sad because I can remember as a kid, you know, driving to the university of Iowa from Davenport when the, you know, a, like that my mom was terrified of the interstate, but she wanted to go to Amana to have cinnamon rolls. Um, but, you know, you had the interstate highways and on the ramps in the late 60s and the early 70s, the state of Iowa was planting prairie grass. It wasn't paving them over, but it said, let's plant the things that like to grow here to, to get rid of erosion. So the Iowans were ahead of the curve with environmentalism, because I can remember going to Indiana and there's not those same kinds of things. So it's, again, it's, it's, it's a sadness. So you had um, uh, agriculture ag guys who were saying, hey, I know how to stop erosion, right? And it wasn't some ideological thing. It was what's going to grow here so that I don't have to keep planting it, right? Let that prairie plant send its roots down because it's the best, it's the right relationship. That it's being they didn't plant it to, and it's not paving nature it's right working more in and that's the part that it is in fact paving and and you see this yeah. reaction all across the country of people saying no we don't want our pastures covered with solar panels no we don't want our view sheds covered with wind turbines and that's exactly what i heard from in fact one of the guests diane fitch who's a, a supervisor in in madison county iowa she says no we this is not we this is not what we want for our county we're gonna this is gonna be the wrong thing for us so that that this idea of saving, oh, we have to, we have to destroy nature in order to save it just as this kind of uh, insanity. But uh, yeah. um, anyway, I digress. So uh, last question, Sally, if you don't mind. So what you, 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 we've talked a lot about faith and we've talked a lot about belief and redemption and sin. What gives you hope? What gives me hope? The energy of my, uh, lots of things, but the, the um, let me start over. Since it's, I'm primarily a teacher on this podcast, the energy of my students, they, they, they are not ideologues. They are so excited to figure out what are we going to do next? And so a lot of people are in despair and talk about, oh, the nuns and the students, the N-O-N-E-S, you know, students don't care about religion and that, and that kind of stuff. And it makes me sad that the institutional churches in many ways left them behind. But what are they doing? They're building right relationships. They're treating each other with care and respect. They have a sense of their responsibility to the wider world. And so does it make me sad that they haven't learned how to be nourished by the Christian liturgy? Yes, but they're creating their own new institutional forms and they're doing things together as communities. And, um, and actually I see them as more energized than, than even 10 years ago. They're, they're, they're ready to solve these problems. Um, and that gives me hope that they they really are looking at, and they're not going to be oppressed. So that's the other thing about, you know, the Catholic church. Um, they are not going to let the institution let them down, right? They're not going to put up with so that they don't go to church. Well, they're not going to put up with bad liturgy. They're not going to put up with these ignorant ideas about um, the human body and about, you know, personal activity as opposed to, you know, social activity. And they look at something like Catholic social teaching and they say, okay, 
I know how to, I'm smart. I have a degree from engineering or public health or English literature from Santa Clara, and I don't need, you know, somebody to explain Catholic social teaching to me. I'm going to figure out how I'm going to use Catholic social teaching in my uh, junior English class. Um, they're, they are, they're not frozen in ideology. That's going to be one of the positive outcomes with the collapse of, um, with the crisis that the church is in, but it's going to be uh, decades, maybe centuries. You know, it, it took um, Vatican II centuries to respond to Martin Luther. We didn't really respond to Martin Luther until 1962. Think about it. <laughs> it was only 300 years. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> 360. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. they had other things to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Big yeah. lawn at Vatican City. They had to cut. There was things that yeah. things had to do. Yeah. Well, it and was, you're uh, also alluding to this in terms of, you know, you've got the now you've got these supposed experts in climate. And we've got to be careful. If they start to control the conversation and suppress those other voices, right? Just the way the Catholic Church, the institutional church, suppressed a lot of other voices, right? Because it wasn't that long ago that if you wanted, to, if you were a woman and you wanted to serve the Catholic Church, you could be a grade school teacher or a nurse, right? The religious women, those are the two things that they could do. And when religious women started to say, you know, I think I want to be a lobbyist and, you know, go to Washington and use and get my law degree so that I can help the poor, um, you know, the, those, a lot of that was a lot, a lot of women, they're, they were suppressed the way that some of this ideological stuff in climate change is suppressing the creativity that comes from the, from the bottom up. Now that's an interesting parallel. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but yeah, I think that I, I, I do think, and I agree with you completely that this suppression of the debate and the suppression of ideas and the, even the suppression of technologies um, and the and the purposeful closure of critical technologies for for resilience, reliability, and now I'm talking about nuclear plants. Yeah, it really is dangerous. And it, yes, it and, is. You know, on a societal level, it's dangerous because it risks the failure of the electric grid. And that, to me, is I mean, th th we'd have catastrophic results if that happened. Right. But and anyways. that's why your thing is good about don't freeze that idea. Don't freeze the idea. You've always got to be developing the idea. Well, that's a great way to end it. Well, Sally, my, my guest has been Sally Vance Trimbath, my friend, Sally Vance Trimbath, the uh, mother of the uh, wonderful Alex Trimbath at Breakthrough Institute. Uh, Sally, million thanks. Uh, you don't have a call to action. You can look her up. She's a, a theologian at Santa Clara University. You can look her up. Uh, she's got some good recent videos I saw on uh, theology and, and the university. Um, so you can find her there. Um, thanks a million, uh, Sally, for being on the Power Hungry podcast. And uh, thanks to all of you out there in podcast land. Uh, tune in next time for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate Thank it. Thanks, Sally. 